Welcome to the Tech Perspective Podcast presented by Flatiron School, the show featuring perspectives and stories from individuals all across the tech industry landscape. My name is Jelani Thomas. I am your host, and I am joined here virtually by a very special guest, business intelligence analyst for BlockFi and Flatiron School alum, Mitch Krieger. Mitch, thanks for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. Cool, cool. Um, and you were a Flatiron School alum. What, when did you start? I started in September of 2020. Uh, so the pandemic was still deep in it. And um, I had originally planned to, well, I started thinking about doing Flatiron probably in May of 2020. And I put it off to the fall thinking that we would be <laughs> in a better place. Uh, turned out not to be the case, but uh, I ended up, didn't, I didn't want to prolong it any longer just because I had a desire to be in person. And so I um, decided to do the, the f- in-person quote unquote uh, yeah. online uh sync synchronized learning uh in starting in september of 2020 nice you like everyone else probably thought oh this this will blow over (laughs) (laughs) this 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 global pandemic it'll blow over yeah Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) uh did you feel like you missed something like i I, i've spoken to students on numerous occasions especially recently because where are we now we're in October of 2021 as we're filming this and like some semblance of like normalcy has come back um there's been like this real desire for folks to come back in person and and my whole pitch has always been I understand completely you know we've been I mean most of us are in our either like mid to you know mid 20s or all the way up to mid 30s all we really know is in person, right? And I'm wondering from your perspective, like, did you feel like when you actually did it, like what, what were some of the things that you were kind of surprised by uh, learning online versus uh, some of the things that might've been, you know, better in a more traditional format? Hmm. Um. I think the the online format um, on the one hand, like made it super easy to connect with staff or other students uh, because, you know, through the Flatiron Slack and we were able like, so like if I had a question or needed help, like, or, you know, we could, um, I could easily find that help and not, Mm -hmm. there wasn't that intimate, like, I feel like sometimes for some people, there's a little bit of intimidation in asking for help because, you know, you have to physically go and seek it out. And when it's just like a Slack message, there's the the barrier to entry for that help is a lot lower, especially like early on in the program and especially with, you know, the faculty. And so um, when, but it, so there's a lot of differences in terms of like the, the remote environment to the online environment. I think uh, on that same, in that same line of thought, there's also like, if you're sitting in a room with a ton of people working on something and you can also just kind of like pop over and like, say like, Hey, like, what did you get for this problem? Or what did you right. do for that? Like, you know, yeah, like, so yeah. like that, they tried to kind of replicate that for, like in a zoom room. But the problem is, is like, everyone can hear you in a zoom room. It's not leaning over <laughs> to your buddy and like saying, you know, and so like, it meant that like, it, it would be the equivalent of like being in the room and shouting your problem aloud. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like a little weird to get used to. And like, um, but I, I think the at the end of the day, do I think that what I learned um, in the online environment was less than the in-person environment? No, um, it was definitely like, I think I would have gotten the same content either way. And there's just pros and cons to both. And um, I would say to anyone who is concerned about like wanting to do the program, um, but is concerned about going in person because of, prior existing conditions or, you know, some upcoming 
you know, wave that we don't know about or the next pandemic, <laughs> I, knock on wood, that doesn't happen anytime soon. Mm. I would encourage them to do it anyways and not necessarily like put it off for um, in person. I think as career changers for the, I think the maj- most people in the flat iron mm. sphere, um, there's always the like ease of saying like, oh, I may be comfortable in my current situation um, and maybe for the stability's sake, especially in the midst of a global pandemic where the job market is who knows what, um, Mm -hmm. maybe I should just hold on to what I'm already doing. My response to that is, yes, it may be secure, but what we saw in the pandemic that nothing is secure, like, Mm -hmm. you know, and that now is actually the time to make a move because if you don't make a move now, you're always gonna make an excuse um, why you shouldn't make a move and you're just gonna be stuck where you are and you need to take the leap of faith and the pandemic is actually an incredible moment to do so. So that's a long way of saying, I did the online program because (laughs) I didn't wanna wait around for the world to get back to quote unquote normal. Um, and I wanted to make sure I was driving my career, um, not waiting around for the correct set of circumstances to happen. So I can by chance do a thing that I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. And the leap of faith part is really the, is the key. I always say like in, in meetings, um, with like, you know, executives or managers or whatever that, this decision is, you know, obviously it's a logistical one, right? It's, it's, it's a pretty hefty amount of money um, to put down on an education um, and on a leap of faith. But in that same breath, it's, it's very much an emotional decision, right? You have to, you have to decide yeah. when, you know, emotionally and, and psychologically, you're actually ready to commit to something, uh, especially the, the 15 week course, right? Like that one was, that was 15 weeks. Monday to Friday, but there was a, there's a lot of time you spend outside of those parameters of the nine to six format, um, right. working on things. Did, did you experience, uh, did you experience burnout with that, that, that level of like sort of compression of a 15 week course? And how did you choose the 15 week course over like the, the more flexible one that kind of gives you a, a lot more time uh, in which to, to finish? Yeah. Um, for me personally, I don't think I experienced burnout. Um, but that's because my career prior to, um, Flatiron, well, well, one, my career prior to Flatiron took a lot of turns and twists. And so the, the leap of faith, I think might've been a little bit easier for me because I had done similar jumps before. Um, But I had actually, the the reason why I don't feel like I experienced burnout is because I started my career as a boarding school teacher. And that is a 24 seven, 365 day, well, minus summer, Um, but it's a 24 seven job. Uh, And even when you're off the clock, you're still living at work and you walk out of your apartment and there is your students. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, Mm. you know, my commute was literally opening my door. Uh, And so uh, I, (laughs) um, so for me, like, I don't know if I'll ever experience a job that is more emotionally intensive, physically intensive um, and just all encompassing like that. So 15 weeks, nine to six, I was like, Oh, that sounds great. You know, like, yeah. I, you know, like, but the, I think the, the, the underlying question is why did I choose that? You know, because the boarding school job, I, you know, like I said, I, my career had moved around a lot and I had taken a lot of leaps of faith. Um, you know, I, worked in theater for a bit and then I worked for a nonprofit and then I worked for NYU and I also was a freelancer and I had like done a bunch of different stuff trying to like figure out like where I wanted to take my career and the appeal of the 15 weeks to me was synchronous learning so Mm. like I as a teacher um, thrive 
in group environments. And so mm. like the flexibility, the options that offered flexibility were a lot more independent learning. And to me, I wanted something that I was working actively with people and in class actively with people because I know that that's the way I learn best. Mm. Um, the second thing is I was confident that this job I was going to get on the other end of this would have a higher salary than I was. I was working at NYU at the time, um, was going to have a higher salary than NYU. And mm -hmm. so I, what I wanted to do was I really wanted to compress it as quick as possible in terms of being in an environment where I was making less money. Uh, Cause I also have a side gig where I tutor. And so that also makes the leap of faith a little bit easier where you have like, something <laughs> fall back on yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um the uh the point is is that like I wanted to compress it to 15 weeks so that I could get through because I just wasn't I knew that whatever money I'd make on the other end mm -hmm. I would make up the increase in salary would make up for the time that I spent intensively doing this one thing rather than spread it out and being in a job that I wasn't happy with and um I just wanted to kind of like get in there, do the thing and move on. Um, right. So that was kind of like my approach, um, which I, I get that it's not for everyone. Um, I think that you definitely need to be in a place financially. You need to be in a place physically, emotionally to do the intensive rather than the flexible option. And I think mm -hmm. the flexible option is great for some people, but that's just what I what I was looking for in an experience. Yeah. And, and you had a lot of, you had a lot of different experiences of boarding <laughs> school, NYU tutoring. Uh, for, yeah. I was a props, props and scenic person uh, for professional theater productions for a while. Um, yeah. I worked at a nonprofit um, yeah. kind of like, you know, helping to build their nonprofit. Yeah. I, I like jumped around a lot and I think it, you know, that came from, I always had wanted to be a teacher. That's what I always thought I wanted to do. Went to college to study that. And then it was great for a while. I worked in a really cool school. And mm -hmm. then I was like, do I want to do this until I retire? Like, because mm -hmm. as a teacher, you know, teachers don't really, I guess you can go into administration, but that's a different job, you know, being a principal. Right. Um, teachers, there is an upper mobility. You just get better at your craft and you do it for the love of doing it. And I loved it, but I just kind of, I think the ambition in me was just kind of, I need something new and interesting and challenging. And, um, and so I started this existential crisis of experimenting <laughs> with my career <laughs> Yeah, and I think yeah. um, what I had to do for myself was let go of that idea of a career path that we're taught when we're young, um, mm. because that metaphor of a pathway means if you stumble along the path or if you fall off the path or if there's a fork in the road and you aren't sure which way to go and you're worried about making the wrong decision, that just the metaphor that's embedded in us prevents us from seeking out experiences that hopefully will help us grow as people and professionals. And so I had to reframe that in my head to rather than be about a pathway, it's like, okay, well, what if I'm just looking for my next big adventure? Teaching mm -hmm. was an adventure. I feel like that adventure has started to come to an end and now I need to search for what's next. And so that's the way I've continued to frame my career um, is when I feel like this adventure is coming to a close and I'm not learning and growing as a person, I'm moving on to something else. Um, and like I said, I'm lucky that I have a side gig that I can like increase and decrease when I'm, you know, in need of some more money. And that's the beauty of tutoring S secondary strings of income in general. I highly recommend for anyone who can swing it um, because it does make that leap of faith easier to jump and say, okay, I'm going to make this wild thing where I'm going to quit my teaching job and I'm going to go work at a theater festival in Massachusetts uh, for the summer. <laughs> and then I'm going to come back to the city and I'm going to try to like work on props and set design. And it, it was great and it was lovely. And um, it was like a wild adventure and I learned so much. Um, yeah. So 
to me, Flatiron was the, the, the latest iteration of that. And this current job that I'm in was the latest iteration of that. Um, and I think that Flatiron's a great place to do that because you get the tools that you need to make a pivot, even if they aren't the tools that you'll end up using in your job, because they kind of introduce you to the ecosystem and how to think about your, whether it's software engineering or I did data science um, or cybersecurity or UX design. So um, for me, I felt like they, like I said, like in my day-to-day -day job, I don't, I definitely use the things that I learned at Flatiron, but the majority mm -hmm. of my job I think it was more the, the ecosystem and understanding the different pieces of the ecosystem and being able to like adapt and like teach myself if need be. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the most valuable piece of Flatiron is, is that ecosystem piece. Right. To me. I agree. I agree a hundred percent. I, one of the things I, I say all the time is that we can't, it's impossible for us to teach you everything, right? We can't teach you everything. We can sort of lay the foundation um, that'll give you the required skill set to be able to be marketable in the, in the workforce. But uh, essentially what we're doing is laying the foundation and teaching you how to learn and pick up skills because the, the industry is changing um, so often. Something that you mentioned uh, as, as you were talking, I, I thought about the fact that you were a tutor and a teacher and you kind of come from this traditional background in education. Um, what made you decide to go to a boot camp as opposed to continuing on that path hmm. of, of education, yeah. especially being a teacher, right? Like learning how to be a teacher, you would, I think, traditionally probably tell someone, um, you know, follow this career path, go to college. And if you yeah. want to get an advanced degree, get that. So what, what made right. you decide to, to go in that? That's direction? a great question. Well, I think the thing to preface this is that I worked in schools and for, uh, besides NYU, which is a very traditional institution, um, I worked for schools and I went to schools that were very non-traditional. <laughs> um, so like the boarding school was a program where students came from across the country for one semester to study New York City. And we did it using experience-based learning. And so teaching class was teaching on the street, you know, um, and like uh, using the city as our classroom and laboratory. And so like, like uh, to me, I'm no, I'm a big proponent of actually alternative forms of education. And, you know, like there is a big push in our society towards college and university track and anyone who wants to do that, I do not push them away from it. But I also, you know, recognize that it is not for everyone. And I know plenty of students, prior students of mine who have taken alternate funny paths. And, um, and so that wasn't something that scared me off the like non-traditional nature, you know, like you get a certificate from Flatiron, but that's not the same thing as getting a degree, you know, like, like, yeah. so the real reason, the, the core of the reason why I chose a boot camp over um, going back to school full-time, which I did consider, um, I was looking at master's degrees programs in a lot of different topics, um, including data science. Mm -hmm. um, and what it came down to was the time length. What, um, as someone who is questioning their career, as someone who, even though I had a feeling like this is maybe a direction I want to go in, I didn't know if it's what I wanted to do until I retire, you know? And right. so to spend two to three years, if you're going full time, maybe longer if you're going part-time in a degree program dedicated to something that's admirable and great if that's the thing you definitely 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 know you want to do right. um but i wanted to leave the door for myself to say like okay like this you know data science thing is cool i did the boot camp i'm in a job now that's you know related to that and I'm learning and growing and experience that, but I didn't want to like then knowing myself that I had had so many career jumps in the past, mm. um, 
I didn't want to like then go like, oh, I spent three years on a, you know, master's degree and now, and all that extra money, you know, like even though flat iron, it's not cheap, it is because it's so short, it is a lot mm. cheaper than getting a master's degree. Mm. I didn't want to spend all that money, spend all that time. And then, you know, like two years into my data science career, be like, actually, I want to do something else. And then, you know, and so, mm. cause, so flat iron, the intensity of it, the, you know, the time length gave me the confidence that I wouldn't feel like I wasted the experience of getting a master's degree, uh, but still learning enough new skills to help me make the transition. That makes a lot of sense, man. That makes so much sense. And coming from a non-traditional background, that was kind of like a, all opportunities are open to you, right? Like everything is, yeah. everything is on the table. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think the, um, I think the, the thing that if you're trying to weigh whether to get a master's degree or to go to a boot camp, my advice often is, well, what are you hope? What is the end game here? Right? Are you hoping to become like, are you hoping to break into the field and get a new job? Or are you hoping to learn the craft of data science in, which is a rapidly evolving and changing thing on a deep level so that you can then go far in that world? I feel like a lot of Flatiron alums, in my experience talking with them, um, I don't have a great sample size, but it just seems to me that a lot of people make the transition into tech and then they don't necessarily like sit in that role that they um, studied at flat iron because it gives you the skills to be flexible. And it's like, okay, like now I'm in the tech world, maybe I'll change my skills up a bit and study a bit so that I can shift into this kind of role or shift into that kind of role. Or right. um, it, it, like we were talking about earlier, it gives you that ecosystem, that, you know, foundational knowledge of the world you're in or entering into. And so I think it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to like, are you confident that specifically data science is the thing that you're going to want to do uh, forever? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and the other thing is like, I, I think to your, to your point about the way the, bo the boarding school that you worked at um, was constructed, you kind of taught with experience, right? So even yeah. if, even if data science is something that you wanted to do long-term going into the field, coming here, coming to Flatiron School, learning the skill set, jumping into the field, you're, you're really coming in as a rookie, right? You're coming in as a novice and really not understanding, um, you know, a lot of maybe the most complicated concepts, maybe you understand it on sort of a surface level, but you couldn't, but it, it's not something you can um, necessarily um, apply day one, as opposed to somebody that's been in the field for five plus years or so. But I think to the experience point, like you can learn while in the industry, which is actually a necessity. You can't, you, you yeah. either learn or you die as, as, as some people would, I think that's a quote. I don't know where I got that from, but I think that's <laughs> a quote somewhere. It's, it's evolve or die. That's what it was. Um, yeah. and I think that's essentially, um, why, why this course kind of works for folks is that, um, the people that, that tend to come here are hungry. Like they're ambitious people that really want to, um, obviously changing your career is an incredibly difficult thing to do, especially you come from a non-traditional background or like you come from a background that has nothing to do with tech pivot into this space and then get into this, uh, get into the tech space, which is a completely can be a, a different animal if you're not accustomed to it. And trying to navigate that to some degree can be really difficult, but I think learning on the job and, and building the experience and even, you know, participating in ex extracurricular stuff, like going, uh, joining different groups, doing mm -hmm. hackathons, things of that mm -hmm. nature, um, pro bono work, even like mm -hmm. on the nonprofit space, which I think uh, data for good is such a, such an incredible way to not only give back, but also, uh, sharpen your skill set working with other teams. Like I just think it's just such a wide. It's just so many ways 
to, to get to the same goal. And I think we right. sort of pigeonhole ourselves to like, this is the way that it's always been done. And I think that old guard of like, I was talking to an employer earlier, sort of that old guard of like, we need a master's degree in order for us to even speak to you. I think it's dying out. And it's that, that um, a new crop of people with, you know, a much uh, more open sense of the talent pool that's available to them is, is joining. And I think it's actually really exciting for folks um, jumping into, into tech at this point. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So the, the hiring manager, well, one of the hiring managers for my current job, he mm. didn't go to college at all. He didn't do a boot camp. He was completely self-taught. Um, mm. And so like, I was lucky to have, you know, a hiring manager who like deeply understood that, uh, you know, that there are alternative paths. And just because you took an alternative path doesn't mean that your um, skills are any less than someone who has the same set of skills who took a more traditional path. And I think there's also something to be said about the, the nimbleness of a place like Flatiron, where colleges and universities, like they're amazing institutions. I don't knock them. And I think people should continue to go to them. But mm -hmm. Uh, they're slow. And uh, what I mean by that is it takes a while for them to evolve and to catch up with the times. And I think that <clears throat> the, the whole idea of spending three years studying data science when a year in data science, things change rapidly you know, um, in the landscape, like what are people using? What tools are people using? What new technologies have been developed? You know, like things are coming out all the time. And then add on top of that for me, you know, I work for BlockFi, which is a cryptocurrency company. And uh, so that world of the blockchain and crypto is changing every day, every second, really. Yeah. Um, and so like to think that like just because you have a master's degree you have a leg up i don't know if that's necessarily true because you spent you know three years studying what is but not what's becoming mm. um, and so yeah and and i and well and from a pure like my sector of the industry perspective like there aren't master's degrees in cryptocurrency yet you know, it's like, that's how new it is um, and the blockchain and all that. And so I think you're exactly right that it's um, the, the industry of tech, but I think that, like the world more widely, especially with how expensive college is, is thinking differently about like alternative pathways to getting people into jobs and what is it that we actually need people to be able to know and do on day one versus what do we, what can we coach them through? Yeah. I, and, and I like you think uh, that people should continue to go to college if it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Just like anything in life, you evaluate it to see if it makes sense. And um, I think the one thing I, I think people don't consider is that uh, boot camps came after universities. So it was a response to the fact that universities aren't as nimble. Um, so it's not like we're, it's not like we don't understand the value of a university. It's that we understand the gaps. That's the real thing that um, I think people need to consider when they're when they're thinking about a boot camp is we under we we actually saw the, the the previous institution the previous hundreds of years or whatever that it's it's existed and we think the model has to evolve and this is this is one evolution of it um it won't be the final evolution there will be something that comes on yeah. after boot camps that will change and just like technology it will it will only uh it'll only get better after this but um, I just always think like, when I think of boot camps, I think they're the, the, at least I can only speak to Flatiron School and I'm obviously take this with a grain of salt cause I'm biased, but, <laughs> um, you know, I think this is 
I think this is the, the best place to learn a really difficult thing. Like that's just, yeah. that's kind of the way I, I see things. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, the original Academy was verbal and the reason why it was a physical place in ancient Greece was because the only way you could gain knowledge is by hearing it from somebody. Mm. Um, and then, you know, the printing press came along and then it was, oh, we can actually gain knowledge through text. And that's great. Um, but you need to be able to have access to texts. And so that's why the library became the center of the college campus. Now in the digital age, um, all of, you know, my phone like has all of the information I potentially need. And so the model of education went from being able to know stuff because you're not always going to have the text or you're not always going to have that professor to be able to tell you something that you need to know. So it moved from being able to know stuff to be able to process stuff. Mm. And when I say stuff, I mean things to learn. Um, right. Like, so now, like, I don't need to know all these like facts and figures and things because I can always look it up, right. you know, like when I, when I taught calculus, like they usually have, like in a traditional calculus class, you have students mem memorize uh, the derivative rules. And it's like, every, you know, a lot of people like, that's the one thing they remember from calculus, <laughs> if anything, that the derivative of X squared is two X. Um, but, which is sad that that's the thing that they remember. And that's a rant <laughs> for another time. Um, but uh, the, that, you could look that up whenever and actual mathematicians don't like, sure, they might know that, but like they leverage new tools that are coming out that um, help them do their job and they don't worry about the, that kind of like memorization stuff. It's more about the problem solving. And I feel like, you know, flat iron and data science, it, it, it's in terms of the evolution from the university where it was about knowing stuff and we're seeing this on the k-12 level too where it was about knowing things and that's what was going to knowing skills knowing things that's what was going to get you a new job now anyone can look up stuff to know you know anyone right. can do that the question is do you have the ability to process quickly all the information that's coming at you and devise a plan forward um, and to leverage those things that are coming quickly at you and sift through all of the junk that's online to find those jewels that are going to be the thing that's going to help you achieve the project. And so like, I feel like the, the historical view of education has led to boot camps, mm. uh, the, you know, as a economic response to colleges and universities, but also a response to the times of we're rejecting this idea that you need to actually deeply know and understand things in a digital age where it's yes you still need to be able to do that but it's more about how quickly can you process large amounts of information and find that tool that's going to push you into success i completely agree and as you said that the image that came into my mind was the fact that we used to have to if you wanted to add or divide a really big number by another really big number we would have to spend time on a piece of paper and a pencil writing out the addition or the, mm -hmm. or the division. Now it's just a calculator. Uh, the answer is one calculator away. And that's, it's not lazy. It's efficient, right? Like that's just kind of, you right. kind of use the tools of today to kind of figure out how to get to your answer most efficiently because the, 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 the con understanding the concept and the tools within that concept is far more important and, uh, and to, to getting to the actual uh, goal than like trying to, trying to be a purist to some right. degree, right? And, you know, that's kind of what we're, that's, that's kind of the space that we're in is, is, is the technology space, is the innovation space. We're in that, in that actual mm -hmm. space. Um, you mentioned uh, BlockFi, the company in which you work as a business intelligence analyst. So I wonder if you could just mention a, a little bit about your role and um, yeah, what the company does and sort of a little bit about your role at the company as a business intelligence analyst. Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So, <clears throat> uh, BlockFi is a cryptocurrency company that uh, tries to bridge ideas in traditional finance to and banking to the crypto space. So, for example, at a bank, you know, which is a traditional finance organization, you can open up a savings account, you can get a credit card, you can get a loan. There's all these like different kinds of financial products that you can get at a bank for US dollars. Um, we do similar things for crypto. So you can open up a savings account where you get interest on your crypto. You can get a loan using crypto. You can um, get a credit card that gets you crypto back instead of cash back. Um, and it's this, uh, so that's what we do. And um, my role as a business intelligence analyst, I work on the data science team and we consult with different teams uh, throughout the organization, making mm -hmm. sure that they have the data they need to do their job. If they have some type of analysis or question about, you know, trends and data that they're seeing, um, we can perform that analysis for them. And so what's interesting um, is one, one meeting I'll be in, we're talking about you know, fraud and anti-money laundering. And then the next meeting we're talking about institutional trading and loans. And then the next meeting I'm talking about like data warehouse architecture. And then the next meeting I'm talking, you know, so like it's yeah. all the skills of, you know, like in terms of what I do as a business intelligence analyst, um, the, it's the skills of being able to work with data um, but applying them to different verticals uh, at the company and helping them move the data to be where we need to get it. So that's yeah. the that's the gist of what I do and my role at BlockFi. Nice, nice. As, I wonder it, as a pre as a tutor. I'm not. Do you still you, you still freelance as a tutor? Yeah, of course. Nice secondary stream of income. There it's, you go. If, like, if anything taught me, if the pandemic taught us anything is that relying on your employer completely yeah. is fine, but like you never know what can happen and the business gets upended and suddenly you're out of a job. Um, and so having a secondary stream of income that's in your control is, is great. So yes, of course I'm still tutoring. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you see any, any similarities between tutoring and being an analyst. And I say that because mm -hmm. sometimes as an, as an analyst, people are giving you information that they don't quite understand and you have to interpret it and then give it back yeah. to them in a way that's sort of digestible for them. Do you see any similarities between the two? Oh yeah, of course. Like my, like we've been talking about how my career kind of took a lot of twists and turns, but to me, it's all connected. It's all like, I'm a big proponent of interdisciplinary work. I mean, that's what data science is. It's the intersection of math, computer science, and <clears throat> whatever, um, you know, use case you're using it for. Right. Um, and so, uh, and I guess machine learning too. Um, uh, the, so the whole idea that um, you're right on the money that being a business intelligence analyst and also being a tutor, they're deeply connected in my mind's eye. And what I say to a lot of people when they're looking to make a leap of faith or a job is a job career change is you've got to figure out how to leverage your prior experience and convince other people that that is unique and is actually going to help you in this new kind of role. So for me, where a lot of my career was in education, I leaned into that deeply and I said, hey, like, sure, I can do all this data stuff, but the thing that I'm really good at is staring at the data and being able to translate it into something meaningful and actionable um, and understandable for a non-technical person or for, uh, you know, a, a team or an audience that might not be as familiar with the data or is familiar with the data, but doesn't know how to go about parsing apart the important parts or seeing the trends. Um, and so, yeah, it's deeply connected in my mind. And I think I leaned into that in the job search process um, in order to 
make me stand out from any old person who's applying to this role. And I think that that even if you're a chef, like that is doable. Like there are things that chefs do, or the, there are things that every role does that have transferable skills, and you just have to think deeply, long and hard about what are those transferable skills that you have. And that's the pitch is like, yes, I can do all these skills, but here's what makes me unique. And for me, that was, I'm really good at explaining things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And as you said, chef, I I was trying to find the connection between that and data (laughs) science. And I think I found it. Tell me what you think. As a chef, you have a lot of the, a whole bunch of ingredients that on the surface are just ingredients independent of themselves. And it takes a chef to turn that into something beautiful and, and meaningful mm. and actually has somewhat of a story behind it, depending on the, the origin of the food, right? That's how you can look at data, the data being sort of all spread out on, 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 um, unorganized. And then yeah. you put it all together into this finished visualization or this finished product for an audience to see. How's that? Yeah, that's great. And, and I think like on a, you know, on a working level, there's also like chefs work very deeply and closely with, you know, their sous chef or their, you know, the waiters, the other staff at the restaurant. And there's a Mm -hmm. way in which, you know, like, sure, if you tried to do what you did in the silo, it would, um, be okay, but you rely on these other people. And I always, I rely on the data warehouse team to feed certain kinds of data to me so that I then can manipulate it and give it to uh, the stakeholder. And so, yeah, I think there, there's a lot of ways you can think about this, the skills that you currently have in a current job, like a chef and, um, and leverage them to um, figure out how do I pitch myself uh, to get into this uh, new industry. Yeah. It's like building a narrative, right? Like yeah, it's exactly, the same, exactly. it's the same, it's the same thought process. I, I enjoy data science a lot myself and I, I also enjoy storytelling and I, and the, the connection between the two is um, it's, it's so, it's so clear. Is there any connection that you've made between like your, your love of theater and data science at all? Is there something that you see there? Because I, I, you mentioned that you're interested in theater. You 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 love you like theater, but also uh, it was a stage design. Yeah, so I worked I worked in um, props and set design for a portion of my career, <laughs> which yeah. feels like another lifetime. And yeah. one of the things that I think, uh, like particularly if you're a if you're the crafter. Um, of the prop, you know, the artisan, where you're actually like building something, like at the beginning of it, you know the end goal. Um, So like, I'm trying to think of a good example. Okay, so like there was this one show I was working on, it was a kid's show about, um, um, you know, a monster that's made in a cauldron, you know, kind of like witchy type thing. And there was this like scene where, uh, they needed to, um, they needed to create a cauldron where someone could emerge out of it. Um, and so I, like, you had to not, and so I had to build that. Right. And I recruited some friends to help me, uh, shout out to Mackenzie. (laughs) Um, but I think the thing that like is similar to data science is that there's often a question at the end or a goal at the end. Um, so in this situation, we needed this actor to safely be able to somehow magically emerge from this cauldron, cauldron, um, and make it look to the audience like there wasn't, you know, like that it was just sitting on the ground and, you know, like it, it was yeah. a little bit of, of theater magic. And so we had to devise a plan to do that. And I think data science is similar in that way where you'll often have a question at the end of the day, but how you get there and the methods by which you go about doing it, that's kind of, you have to develop a plan of action. Um, And sometimes you'll, 
your initial plan of action will take you down the wrong road and you'll have to be like, oh shoot. And maybe like take a few steps back or sometimes start over entirely. And that happened all the time in props where, and set design where like you'll create something and they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. There's this one show I was working on. I made this prop that was like a, a book thing. And like the, the props uh, master really loved it. And then uh, they tried to use it in the show and it just like didn't end up working out. And so I spent like, hours creating this thing that they didn't end up using at all yeah, and sometimes yeah. that happens in data science where you spend hours doing something and then um the answer is inconclusive um or you have to backtrack and be like okay that didn't work out how do i approach this question from a different angle or is mm -hmm. there additional data i can get or are there are additional models or tools that i'm missing that i need to add um so yeah it like like I said, to me, like everything is connected and you just have to pay attention to the ways they are um, and how to like use those prior experiences to propel you into new experiences. Completely agree. And uh, I, I think too many times we discount some of the things that we've done, some of the incredible things that uh, we've done in our past that actually really ladder up because um, all of these things are connected, whether we know it or not. Uh, Mitch, Thank you so much. Um, this has been great. Um, before I let you go though, we ask a question always at the end. And the question is, what is a quote that you live by? Hmm. It's so funny. Everyone takes the same pause. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, a quote that I live by. Um... I think <laughs> what's coming to mind, like just off the top of my head with that, like I'm sure there's like, there are, um, there are lots, um, but uh, we talked about this often at the boarding school and it was like one of the like core ethos of how we taught. Um, and it's this quote, I'm not, I'm gonna, it's, it's quite a long quote and I'm gonna like end up butchering. Um, <laughs> butchering a lot of it, but it effectively like, um, it, it effectively goes like this. <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try. Um, so, uh, it's, I think it's a T.S. Eliot quote. Um, don't cease exploration. Uh, do not stop exploring until you arrived back at where you started and you know the place like new for the first time um so for me the reason i bring that up is i think the the process of my career and exploring all these different things is like i continue to explore and what's amazing is i like i come back to myself i come back to who i am and I come back to the questions I'm living um, actively, which is actually another quote, <laughs> uh, but uh, man, wait, I, like maybe get, can I change my answer actually? <laughs> go, go for it, go for it. <laughs> okay, yeah. this quote, I just thought of another quote. Man, I, it's an, also a quote from the school I taught at. Uh, it's called mm. City Term, was the school. Um, mm. But uh, it's um, a Huxley quote uh, that experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. And so I, I'm, I'm now like thinking like that might be like a better like cap on the conversation because I do feel like I live my life that way where it's like experience isn't the thing that you gain based on what you've done or what happened to you. It's the thing that you then do with that. Um, right. and so, uh, to me, like the process of flat iron, the process of career changing so many times, the process of going through and learning new things and discovering new things, it's all about like, okay, that's not the experience. The experience is what do I do with that next? 
Um, and so experience is not what happens to you. It's what you do with what happens to you. So that's, that's, I think, I think I'll go with that one. I mean, the other quote's great too. And I do really believe that, that like, to me, I feel like my job in, in the career I'm in is to my job as a person in the career trajectory I've been on is to be an explorer and to, uh, so I guess they're deeply related. Um, and so that I'm going to continue to explore until I come back to the beginning of where I started from each new exploration and say like, oh, wow, I'm now seeing this with new eyes because right. of the experience that I've had. And it's the same idea of like the propelling forward of yourself based on ex things that you've done is the experience, not the thing that happened in the past. It's a, it's an active future word, not a past. Like I, I think a lot of people think of experience as a past word. Oh, I had an experience or it was an experience or my experience on my resume shows X, Y, and Z. And that's not, yes, those are things that happened to you. Those are things that you did, but the experience piece is what launches you forward into the next phase. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'll say. Sorry. That was it. kind of all over the place. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, that's what the, I mean, the question is always, it makes you go super internal. So um, that's why I always love to end on that piece. Um, I think both quotes make sense and they're both actually, yeah, like you said, deeply related. So I love it, man. Thank you so much. Um, this has been another episode of the Tech Perspective Podcast. See you next time.